So I'll get a grade distribution out to you today, a uh, hypothetical grade distribution. I've had um, you know, a few people have contacted me and said, um, I'm concerned about my grade. Uh, I think I might fail the class. Um, and uh, all I can tell you is uh, that's just very, very unlikely. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about base rate neglect today. Um, you may be suffering from it. Uh, you may be placing too much emphasis on one signal and uh, ignoring the fact that virtually nobody fails the class. Uh, the base rate is just very, very small. Okay. Um, Again, to reiterate, if you have a class right before this one, okay, I see why this isn't working. If you have a class right before this one, it makes it hard for you to get here in time to turn your problem set, you're also not able to hear this announcement. So, um, forget it. Uh, <laughs> I sent out an email, and I sent out another, tell your friends. All right. Okay, so today, we're talking about, the last time we talked about Bayes' rule, and today what we're going to start talking about is quasi-Bayesian modeling, where what we're going to do is we're going to take Bayes' rule and we're going to tweak it a little bit, right? So, we're sticking with this sort of, um, uh, I was about to say, standard behavioral economics approach, which is a bit odd. Um, but but one, of the, one of the things that behavioral economists like to do is to preserve what we can of the standard model and then tweak it in little ways that, uh, that maintains sort of the mathematical tractability of it um, while still allowing it to capture some psychological realism. I would argue that in the case... I would argue... Mm, that's a little too hot. Sorry. I would argue that in the case of prospect theory, right, reference-dependent preferences, and in the case of present bias preferences, the beta delta model, and in the case of projection bias, habit formation, that, our, that by preserving big chunks of the standard model and just tweaking a little bit, sticking in a beta here or an alpha there or a, a lambda uh, for loss aversion, actually does a really pretty good job of capturing psychological realism in ways that are highly generalizable. And I hope I've demonstrated that to some extent. I hope you haven't gotten the impression that I've been picking and choosing the evidence to make it fit the behavioral model. The truth is that these behavioral models fit an enormous amount of evidence. What we're getting into now, this, this area of um, probability inference and the ways in which our actual uh, judgments of probabilities deviate from Bayes' rule, is actually a little bit less satisfying. Um, and so, while quite a lot is known about the ways people get probability inference wrong, and while economists have cared about this for several decades and take it into consideration in applications, um, <clears throat> our mathematical models are less satisfying, in my opinion. Um, and I don't quite why that is. It may just be that the process is more complicated. It may be that the mathematical uh, model that we started with, the Bayes rule, is just more wrong. I don't know. But let's, let's take a look at it. Um, we'll start with this with basic rate neglect, which we already started talking about, and then I'll start winding up the next model, which is a thing called um, belief in the law of small numbers, which, which I'll talk about more next time. So here we were with a Bayes rule anomaly, this HIV test anomaly, right? We had a, an HIV base rate of 1% and an accuracy of the test uh, of 99%, okay? So the signal is 99% accurate for whichever, whatever hypothesis is true, right? Whether you're HIV positive or HIV negative, it'll tell you that with 99% accuracy. Um, and then we, we figured out that the probability, the conditional probability that the person will have HIV if they have a positive test is, is this thing here, right? That's Bayes rule. And then the modal answer for um, econ students at UC Berkeley and lots and lots of other people is, is it's just equal to the accuracy of the test, 0.99, um, which, which is the answer that, that I gave the first time I came across this. And, and, and I, think that if, <clears throat> I think that if I got an HIV test back positive, I would probably conclude that the chances that I was HIV positive were was point out. Because uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, well, we'll see why. This is, this, it turns out this may be fairly deeply hardwired. <clears throat> so in the, in the paper that I was trying to read, which is a short one and quite interesting, it doesn't include a lot of math. I don't think it includes any math. Kahneman and Tversky explain this kind of error in terms of what they call heuristics. So heuristic is a shortcut, okay? It's a rule of thumb. So they say this. People rely on a limited, I think, so this P is in, is in square brackets because it's not really the beginning of the sentence. And I believe that what comes before it is, we think that. So their statement is not quite as bold as it sounds. People rely on a limited number of heuristic principles, or rules, which reduce the complex tasks of assessing probabilities and predicting values to simpler judgmental operations. In general, these heuristics are quite useful, but sometimes they lead to severe and systematic errors. So this is, this is a very sort of canonical theory in, in judgment and decision making, um, uh, which is a branch of psychology. That, that basically, our brains, we don't want to work that hard, so we have shortcut rules. Okay? Now, I don't know if anyone's ever pointed this out to you. Do you guys, if you've taken physics, you know, you can, if, you, if you throw an object into the air, that if you know its velocity and you know the laws of physics and you know the, the force of gravity, you can figure out where it's going to land. Has anyone ever pointed out to you that your body knows how to do this without looking? Over and over and over again, you can get that right without looking at your hands. Okay? So it's a little odd, somehow, to think that what's going on is our brains lack cognitive ability and need a shortcut. But that's the idea. Um, and then there's a paper which is on the website now on vSpace by um, Maya bar -Hillel. Um For some reason, a significant proportion of academic economic articles, uh, this isn't economics, but academic articles about probability come from Israel. I don't know what that is. Um, and what, what Barhillel says is this, and this is a paper that's specifically about uh, this particular error that we're looking at, where people don't pay enough attention to the base rate. People order information by its perceived degree of relevance and let high relevance information dominate low rel relevance information. And she then goes on to sort of say, explain why in certain situations the base rate should be less relevant than the signal. The base rate fallacy is thus the result of pitting what seem to be merely coincident, coincidental, therefore low relevance base rates, against more specific or causal information, meaning the signal. So the test is in your face, right? And then you have some notion that it's particularly important because it's this highly accurate thing, so it has some causal linkage, and so you treat it as more relevant than the base rate, and you have a heuristic, which is just code what's in front of you. Get the job done. Don't work so hard. Use a shortcut. Just use the highly relevant information and tune out the other information because it's just too hard. I mean, we've, we've been through Bayes. Well, it's not that hard. But that's what this theory says, is that people just tune out the less relevant information because they need a shortcut. Okay. Now, what I want to do next is slightly, it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure because I'm now going to dip into psych evolutionary psychology, which I typically scorn. But this, I think this is kind of cool. And someone pointed this out last time and it jogged my memory, so I went and dug, dug this up. Um, this woman named Hazelton, I'm sorry, I can't remember her first name. She's down, at UC, I believe, at UCLA, has written quite a lot um, about a theory in psychology that she calls error management. Okay? And, and this is a paper with a number of co-authors that came out a couple years ago. The effects of error management are cases in which errors that were less costly over evolutionary history are favored over more expensive ones, producing biases in the direction of the less costly error. Okay? So evolution may, in fact, be biased towards what's referred to as type 1 error. If you're trying to stay away from dangerous objects, for example, type 1 error, which is called a false positive, would be, that's a snake. And you run, or you do whatever you do, and then you look back and you say, oh, silly me, it's just a snake. And maybe your friends laugh at you. Not very costly. Type 2 error, which is a false negative, oh, that's just a stick. You step on it, it turns out to be a snake. Your friends are not laughing. 
right? So if there's some cognitive process built into the brain of certain individuals that causes them to make type 1 error by ignoring base rates, right? Um, right? The, the base rate neglect causes this error because you see the signal, that looks like a snake. Now, when something is a snake, it, when something is a snake, it looks like a snake with very high probability. When something is a stick, it looks like a st snake with relatively low probability. Okay? So the signal looks like a snake is, a mu is much more accurate in the case of snake than it is in the case of stick, but there's just a lot more sticks in the world than there are snakes. Right? The base rate of snake is low. So if you're ignoring base rates, you come up with type 1 error and you jump whenever you see a stick. Okay? And, and you get to live to tell the story. <laughs> Right? And if you're hardwired for some other bizarre reason to pay too much to, to not do that, and to like for some reason you just randomly were mutated into someone who gets Bayes rule perfectly right, you're dead. Okay? So, uh, and it turns out, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have a citation for this, I wasn't able to dig it up. Um, but it turns out that neurologically, when a human being sees a snake, the motor reaction to get out of the way of the snake takes place before the conscious part of the brain becomes aware that it has seen the snake. Okay? I don't know if that's true with other dangerous animals, but uh, and you can you can see this. I've actually watched myself jump out of the way of a rattlesnake on the trail before realizing it was a rattlesnake on the trail. Um, it's easier to notice those things if you're on extended meditation retreat. Okay, the point is, that's great if you're in the woods trying to avoid snakes and wild boars, right? Um, but it starts to become costly in the modern setting. So it turns out, as I pointed out last time, that diagnosing someone with HIV incorrectly can ruin their life, right? Or diagnosing, uh, say, the head of the French Socialist Party as a rapist uh, incorrectly can ruin their career and the uh, political hopes of their party. Um, this is in the problem set. Randomly searching people at colored airports can undermine social harmony. Um, this, is, this is what the British would refer to as an understatement. So these things may be not mistakes in terms of our brain as the control unit of an animal in the wild, but they become, they, they start looking like mistakes when we actually start existing in a world in which we need to know Bayes' rule, right? Okay, so that's end of guilty pleasure interlude. Uh, now let's go back to being economists. Um, fortunately for us as economists, our job is not to wonder why, but just to model it. So what we want to do, what we care about in psychology is not why it happens, or it's certainly not evolutionarily where it comes from, but simply what is the key psychological insight about what's happening in the brain? And the key, it seems that the key psychological insight is that we pay too much attention to new information. Perhaps it's because it's new, perhaps it's because it's highly salient in some other way, and we forget to account for the past experience, which in this case is the base rate, okay? So now let's take a quasi-Bayesian approach to modeling this, which turns out to be disarmingly simple, which probably means it's wrong, but... So we're, we're going to take this quasi-Bayesian approach, which as I said means that we're going to preserve as much of the mathematical framework of Bayes' rule as possible, and then just tweak it in one little place. Okay? So all we're going to do is that we're going to say, okay, so there's a set of hypotheses out there, and so far we've looked at, at, at yes, no, has HIV, doesn't have HIV, is a snake, isn't a snake, and then I, I give you one example where there are three possible states of the world, right? High ability, medium ability, low ability, and basically we're going to model base rate neglect by simply saying, let's just assume that the person treats the probability of all states of the world as equal. Now, what's interesting here is that that assumption in itself doesn't seem particularly psychologically realistic to me. It doesn't seem like we have evidence here that that's actually what's going on in the brain. But mathematically, what it does is it makes the base rates just disappear from Bayes' rule. Okay? And that's because of the way Bayes' rule is actually set up. So this is, again, this is sort of where keeping the structure of Bayes' rule allows us to make a tweak that captures uh, what we do think is going on psychologically. So according to Bayes' rule, right, the probability that you're HIV positive if you have received a positive test is equal to the probability that you were HIV positive in the first place times the probability that you would get a positive test if you were HIV positive, divided by right, the probability that you would get a, the unconditional probability that you would get a test, which is the probability of getting a test, in each, the sum of probabilities of getting a positive test in each situation. So that's the same thing, probability of HIV positive times. So you always just start out with the same thing. Plus the chance that you would have seen a test if you were HIV negative. Right? So probability that you were HIV negative times the probability that you would have gotten a positive test if you were HIV negative. All right, that's Bayes' rule. That much we know. What we want to do here is we want to identify within Bayes' rule the base rates. That's the base rate probability that you have HIV. There it is again. Base rate probability that you have HIV. And there's the base rate probability that you don't have HIV, right? And you can, you can immediately see that if you set those, those things equal, they go away, right? Because they, they, they show up uh, in, the, in, every, in every term. So we just factor them out and they go away. So in the case of the HIV uh, example, that's probability that you have HIV becomes 0.5. It's really 0.01, but it becomes 0.5. And then there's the accuracy of the test. And then the denominator becomes 0.5 times 0.99 plus 0.5 times 0.01. Okay, so again, what, we've, what we're doing is we're making these base rates all the same, which is not what we think goes on psychologically, but it has the result, mathematically, of making them go away. Aha, the modal answer in the population. And, and, and in any application of Bayes' rule whatsoever, setting the base rates equal will make them cancel out, regardless of what the conditional probabilities of the signal, seeing the signal in the different states of the world is. That's just the structure of Bayes' rule. So does anyone see why that might not be quite so satisfying? Why is it exactly 0.99? Anybody see why it's exactly 0.99? Is there anybody sitting there who knows the answer who's just not raising their hand? This is a pedagogically correct strategy. I'm supposed to know that. The reason it's exactly 0.99 is because the denominator is exactly 1. And the reason the denominator is exactly 1 is because the conditional probability of getting an HIV positive result if you have HIV is exactly the additive inverse, sorry, not the additive inverse, the probabilistic inverse, if you want, of the, probability, uh, the conditional probability of getting a positive test if you don't have HIV. The accuracy of the test is the same for both HIV positive and HIV negative. So it detects the true state with the same accuracy regardless of the state, which means that when you take the base rates out of the denominator, what's left sums up to 1. 
And that is true only in the special case where a professor makes it true in the example, right? In general, <laughs> that is not the case. So as you'll see in the problem set, uh, and in a minute, in a different example, that doesn't, there's absolutely nothing that would make that the case. So if you went and did a bunch of these tests experimentally and had people say what they thought the, pro the conditional probability of something was given a signal, and over and over and over again, what you saw was that they just told you the accuracy of the test. Or then, then you would say, ah, this, this model is a kludge. This model is not quite right. It's, it's getting the right answer for the wrong reason. Or it's getting the direction of the answer right, but it's not really, and maybe, so it's a little unsatisfying. Um, but let's, let's, see, let's see it in action in another setting before we render judgment. Here's another anomaly I've already shown you, the Linda anomaly from the paper that you're required to read. Linda's 31 years old, single outspoken, and very bright. Now keep in mind, as I said, this is 1974, right? So the fact that, so then she says she majored in philosophy. Uh, I hope you guys know simple things about our society, like Harvard only became co-ed in 1969. Uh, so the fact that she has a degree in anything is notable in 1974. Um, as a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice. That was also relatively new in those days. And she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. So this is, in 1974, this is a very strong signal about Linda, right? And the, the anomaly is that what people think is that, um, just to put it in, in terms of Bayes' rule, People's rankings of the likelihood of certain states of the world reflect that they believe that, she is, that the probability that she's a feminist bank teller is greater than the probability that she's a bank teller. Okay, so that's the anomaly. So let's see what we can do uh, with, with base rate neglect. So let's call this descriptive paragraph a signal that Linda is a liberal. Let's just take all of, that, all of those different individual signals, just lump them together and say she's a liberal. And I don't know what word people would have used in 1974, but let's just say she's a liberal. Um, back then, liberal probably meant something a little bit less inflammatory. And then let's just suppose, here's the professor making a less convenient set of assumptions, but nonetheless convenient, that the probability that, she would, that you'd see a signal of her being liberal, the probability that she's a liberal, if she's a bank teller is 0.15. Okay, so 1974, bank teller is pretty conservative bunch. Okay? But that the probability that she's liberal, if we already know that she's a feminist bank teller, right, is 0.75. So the only, the, only feminist, the only feminists who go into being a bank teller are very, very likely to be uh, liberal. And then the probability that she's liberal if she's either not a bank teller or not a feminist bank teller. So she's just a member of the general population, 0.5. So this is sort of like some under, underlying base rate of liberalism. Um, and then these are the conditional probabilities of being liberal, depending upon whether or not you're a bank teller or a feminist bank teller. And you can just immediately see, I mean, this is, the, this is the sort of the accuracy of the signal, right? And so the signal is much more accurate if she's a feminist bank teller than if she's a bank teller. Yeah. Uh, I think what I'm doing here, this is sort of, I thought about that. I, I, I think what I'm doing is I'm saying the population of bank tellers is relatively tiny relative to the rest of the population. So I'm going to treat people, I'm going to treat, you know, the probability that she's, the probability that she's liberal if she's not a feminist bank teller has to be slightly different than the probability that she's liberal if she's not a bank teller, but by a very, very, very tiny amount. So I'm just going to treat them as the same. It's not going to change the problem. Because there's, because just how many bank tellers are there? There's 350 million Americans. Uh, the rate of liberalism in these two groups is going to be about the same. Okay. Did I answer your question? I think it did, but if it didn't, it's because I didn't understand your question. So. Okay, so what we want to know is the probability that Linda is a feminist, is a bank teller, or feminist bank teller, these two things, conditional on the signal that she's a liberal, okay? We know the base rate of feminist bank tellers cannot be larger than the base rate of tellers, right? That's just, that's a, that's a physical impossibility. There can't be more uh, of one type of thing than there are things. And that means that the probability that Linda's a feminist bank teller cannot be larger than the probability that she's a teller, right? That's this, this statement can't be, cannot be correct. So let's actually compute those probabilities, conditional on the signal that we've received, um, in the model where base rate neglect is causing us to ignore the information about the base rate, right? Even if we, we're not so dumb that we can't figure that out, we just happen to be ignoring it because we're hardwired to avoid snakes. So let's just, let's just assume, no, I want to say assume. So we're going to treat the probability that someone is a bank teller as being equal to the probability that they're not a bank teller. That little symbol means not, um, and that they're both equal to 0.5. And we're going to assume, similarly, that the probability that someone is a liberal bank teller is equal to the probability that they're not a liberal bank teller, 0.5. Right? And it has to be 0.5 because these are, these are both binary things. You're either a bank teller or you're not a bank teller. Um, so there's only two possible states in the world. Now, if we crank up our quasi-Bayesian model, what we get is that the probability that you're a bank teller if we've already observed that you're a liberal, is, so we can stick in that 0.5 times the probability that you're a liberal given that you're a bank teller, divided by that same thing, plus, whoops, 0.5 times the probability that you're a liberal if you're not a bank teller, which is equal to 0.15, right? That's the proportion of bank tellers who are liberal, divided by 0.15 plus 0.5. 0.15 being the proportion of the rest of the population are liberal, um, which happens to be equal to 0.23. Now I'm getting frustrated because my CPU can't handle uh, my stylus, so I'm going to do the rest on the board. And then when I get my next raise, instead of putting part of it into my 401k, I'll buy a new computer.